In last week's video, I told you that I now have a coda, but that's not entirely accurate because I have two codas. And this white car here is not an ordinary coda. It's a special prototype car with a completely different and nonsensical drivetrain. Roughly four months ago, I got an email from a guy who I'll call Mr. White, because he has a Bounder RV. And in this email, Mr. White said that he is a battery engineer, and he used to work for a company called Coda Automotive. And in his yard are three Codas, two prototypes and one roadworthy production model car. And he was thinking about cleaning up his property and getting rid of these Codas that he didn't want around anymore. And he was thinking about sending them off to the scrapyard. But before he sent them off to the scrapyard to die, he thought he'd reach out to me to see if maybe I wanted them. And y yes, yes, uh -huh, yeah, mm -hmm, I am interested. I, please, I, I want them. Now, Mr. White lives in California. So he assumed that since these cars were almost 2,000 miles away from me, two of them don't work and Codas aren't really worth that much to begin with, that I wouldn't have much interest in them. But he was wrong. I've had a Coda on my list for several years now, so when three of them pop up for free, how do I get them? And the big question with these cars was indeed logistics. I could have hired a shipping company to go get these, a shotgun hauler or what have you, but I didn't want to do that because two of the cars were inoperable. Finding a shotgun hauler that was willing to, willing to deal with two inoperable cars would have been challenging. A shotgun hauler would have been expensive, especially for three cars coming all the way from California to Missouri. And the guy's a former engineer at Coda. I wanted to pick his brain. There's some invaluable information in there. So what I did was, my mom has an F-250. I asked her if I could borrow that for a week. And I know a guy locally who has a two-car gooseneck trailer. I asked him if I could borrow that for a week. So as soon as I could, I went out to California with a borrowed truck and a rented trailer and picked these two cars up myself. And by the way, the third car is still at his house. I'm going back to California in the near future to go get it. So that's how I found these two cars. I didn't. Someone just emailed me because I have the best job ever. And he was just trying to get rid of his junk to clean up his property a bit. You know that saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure? Could not be more true in this case. So what's up with this parts car here? I'll just drop it on you. This is an electric car with a CVT, and it's even more absurd than it sounds. This car is one of a batch of, I think, five Codas that was bought by a company called EDI, Efficient Drivetrains Incorporated, to use as a development platform. EDI chose Codas as their development platform cars simply because they were cheap. This is after Coda went bankrupt, so the cars were sold at steep discount. Side note, all of my information about these EDI prototype cars comes from a single blog post made in 2014. That's all the information I could find online. I'll link to that blog post down below. Anyway, the Dongguan Research Institute in China, which I will henceforth refer to as the DRI, contracted EDI to develop electric cars with CVTs in them. Now, why would they want electric cars with CVTs? Apparently because they wanted electric cars with something different or unique about them. It's the only information I have about their motives. Now, the engineers at EDI, they're no dummies. They know that putting a CVT in an electric car doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. But the DRI is the customer. And if the customer wants you to develop electric cars with CVTs in them and they're paying, EDI is going to develop electric cars with CVTs in them, no matter how little sense it makes. I should briefly explain before I continue why a CVT doesn't make sense in an electric car for those of you who may not be aware. Ignore this mess. A CVT, or continuously variable transmission, can infinitely change the ratio of the gearbox without steps or gear changes. When made into an internal combustion engine, this can be helpful because it means the transmission can vary ratios and therefore speed of the car without changing the speed of the engine. This allows the engine to stay put at whatever rev range delivers either peak power or peak efficiency, while the gearbox does all the ratio changing and speed changing of the car. Now, obviously, it's more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. But electric motors do not work like internal combustion engines. They don't have anywhere near as limited of a power band, and the efficiency does not vary greatly depending on the speed of the motor. So having a transmission at all, in general, is superfluous. Having a CVT mounted to an electric motor just adds drag, complexity, and inefficiency with no real gain. And oh boy, did adding a CVT add complexity, because you can't just plop a CVT in here and have it work. No, it's a little bit more complicated than that. See this right here? That's a hydraulic pump. Now, I'll admit here that my knowledge gets a little bit fuzzy. I'm guessing when it made it to a normal engine, it's the torque converter 
that acts as a hydraulic pump, provides hydraulic pressure to the CVT to actuate the cones and everything. And in the absence of a torque converter and an engine to drive it, they had to fit these hydraulic pumps to drive the actuators and stuff in a CVT. Like I said, my knowledge is really fuzzy on the topic, but regardless of what these hydraulic pumps do to the CVT, they are here for the CVT, and there are two of them, and they are quite large. And to drive those hydraulic pumps is this whole unit back here, which has been bolted into the trunk. These two boxes are brushless DC motor controllers for the hydraulic pumps to drive them, and the rest of this box contains, among other things, a massive DC to DC converter, which steps up 12 volts from the car's battery to 48 volts to drive the hydraulic pumps. So all in, the car's main battery pack of 330 volts is being stepped down by one DC to DC converter to 12 volts, and then being stepped back up again to 48 volts by a second DC to DC converter to drive the hydraulic pumps. Also, this car can have a CVT in it. And if that wasn't bad enough, the DRI also wanted these cars to be cheap, and all the complexity that CVT added was not going to be. So EDI performed a big cost-cutting measure. They took out the high-quality but rather expensive UQM motor and controller and swapped them out for a motor made in China and a Simicron inverter. The motor they put in here is a Jinjing motor, which according to Jinjing's website, produces a maximum of 80 kilowatts and 175 newton meters of torque. Compare that to the original UQM motor's output of 100 kilowatts and 300 newton meters of torque. It wasn't bad enough they put a CVT in here, they also had to throw in a weaker motor because it's what the customer wanted. This whole thing is just odd. I feel like I'm missing information. Now I have to assume that EDI's plan was not to sell, to convert and sell the five or so Codas they got. I assume that they were using these five or so Codas strictly as development and test mules for all of this stuff in here. Now I say that for two reasons. One, because these cars are not in China, they're in my shop but also because if they were planning to convert and sell these actual cars, the cheaper option would not have been to source and adapt a new motor and controller that was cheaper. The cheap option would have been to leave the UQM motor and controller that came with the car in the car. Now, I'd love to see what the end result of all this CVTification nonsense is, but sadly, this car is inoperable. Before it got delivered to Mr. White's possession, EDI stripped it of some main control computers, so nothing on it works. When you plug in 12 volt power to it, some gauges light up, the radio comes on, and the blower motor works, but that's about it. Everything else does not work. Because I don't care how little sense it makes, this is very interesting. They went to a lot of work to make this CVT happen in here, and they <laughs> I just wanted to see what the end result was. But unfortunately, don't think I'm gonna be able to. I'd also like to know more about the story behind these cars too, but I don't think that's gonna happen either. In the years since this car was built, EDI has been bought out by Cummins, you know, the diesel company. And their website is no longer functioning, so I can't, you know, look up any information. If that wasn't bad enough, this car was built seven years ago, so there's every chance that the people that worked on this car and know anything about the story behind it no longer work at EDI. That said, if any of you out there know anything more about these weird EDI CVT prototype cars, send me an email, I'd love to know more information. Circling back a little bit, all three of the Codas in Mr. White's possession were part of this batch of EDI prototype cars. And yes, that means this one, my stock roadworthy Coda, was also an EDI prototype car. Mr. White, with his background in engineering at Coda, converted this Coda back to stock configuration. And what a job that must have been. He did a pretty good job of it too. The only remnants are some loose wires in front and some rib nuts in the back where that box mounted into the trunk. He was initially going to convert all three of these Codas back to stock configuration, but one, that would have been way too much effort, and two, he was missing parts. So he converted this one and then stopped. I actually have sitting on a shelf over here behind the Robin, the Jinjing motor, Simicron inverter, and all the hydraulic pump control box stuff that came out of my black car. There's a lot more electric car parts to be had when I go back to California, but this is what I have now. All the stuff that came out of my black car when the conversion back to stock was done. Now to answer the question you probably weren't asking. What do I want with this parts car and the one that's still in California? Parts! Although I suppose I should be a little more specific than that. The Coda's battery pack is made up of 3.2 volt nominal LiPo 4 cells, which is exactly what the WeGo's battery pack is made up of. You see where I'm going with this? 
The Kona's battery pack is going to make the WeGo live again. The WeGo's battery pack is only 115 volts nominal compared to the Kona's 333 volts because each one of the 36 LifePo 4 cells that makes up the WeGo's battery pack is a massive 260 amp hour battery cell compared to the battery cells out of the Coda, which I showed you in the last video, which are only roughly, I think, 14 amp hours a piece. But that doesn't matter because the battery chemistry and the voltages are all the same. So all I have to do to make these flask size cells work in the Wego's battery pack is to rewire and reconfigure them. To replace each massive cell in the Wego's battery pack, all I have to do is wire like 18 of these little cells together in parallel and then put those in the battery pack as 36 banks of like 18 or so of these little cells wired together. And then it'll look like to the car's onboard computer like nothing has changed. I won't have to make any software or hardware changes or do any re-engineering work to the WeGo other than physical reconfiguration of the battery pack, which is important because I don't have any of the equipment or really knowledge to do any of those re-engineering or software changes. So that's my main plan with this parts car, to make the WeGo live again. I don't know how soon I'll get around to that project. Hopefully it's sooner rather than later, but we'll see. So that's my two Codas and the rather odd story behind them. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in next week's video where I show you what it took to get this car back on the road.